you see a four-year-old stand up on a leg and walk and mom cry, that's a great feeling. When you've treated patients for over 30 years and you go to their weddings and, you meet, and they come in with their kids, that's a great feeling. Every day you make a difference in someone's lives. So I lost my leg to bone cancer at the age of 15 and I was on chemotherapy for about a year and a half after that. And that's when I kind of got involved with the Paralympics. I didn't know about the Paralympics. My physical therapist introduced me to the Paralympics. And then from there, um, things just kind of happened. Todd and Dennis are both amputees, one's above the knee, one's below the knee. They were very active in one of the first true, what we call para-Olympians, amputee Olympians. They both have won gold medals, they've competed around the world, and they have really have aspired other amputees. I was able to compete in three different Paralympic Games in 88, 1988, 1992, and 1996, and set world records for my events. I was inspired by people, you know, the Terry Fox story, Terry Fox running across Canada. When I saw that on HBO, that really inspired me. So I think people saw, you know, seeing me run or hearing about me running and sprinting like we did, uh, I think was inspiring to other people. In September of 1986, I ran 100 meters that day. I ran it in 25 seconds. And um, I got beat by a lot of guys. And uh, I was hooked right there. It was very intense. It was, um, it was also very, uh, very different because you know, it wasn't like a normal kind of training you know, of what athletes would think about because you're learning to use the prosthesis. But once you got to the point of where you learned, where you mastered the prosthesis, then the training became normalized. But it took two years to get to that point because, you know, walking on a prosthesis is one thing. When you're sprinting on a prosthesis, you know, at 16, 17, 18 miles an hour, that's a whole, to totally other, you know, dimension and that takes a lot of muscle strength and coordination. When we started, we were kind of pioneers. There wasn't many people doing this in the late 80s. Dennis and myself were kind of the pioneers. We weren't the first ones to do it, but we were the first ones to really take it to a different level. You know, no one ever ran as fast as we did on the prosthetics, so once we did that, I think the biggest thing we did was we changed what was a recreation into a true sport. People wanted to be competitive because we were out there training and being competitive and we were winning. You know, we were dominant for three, four, five years in the beginning. You know, we were undefeated. Um, people had to train to be part of this to be able to run as fast as we did. So what we did is we went out and started doing running clinics and we started training people. We, we trained our competition. I've known Glenn for a long time. I'm, I'm lucky now we're able to work together, but I've known him for 25 years. He's one of the best practitioners in the world, and to be able to not only work with him, but to have him be my practitioner now to make me a prosthesis is very exciting. Love working with my hands, love making things, and this is a, a making field. You fabricate, put things together, but you're applying the people, and every day you make a difference because you, you help people's lives. The field started originally Worked with wood, plaster, and leather, which I was trained in. Mm -hmm. Then it went to resins and carbon fibers. Now it's all computer age de design where we will, instead of casting a patient, we'll scan with an imager. That scan will go into a computer and we'll modify a computer and then carve with a carver. So it's, it's progressed. We have microcomputer, microcompressor knees. We have power knees that can help patients walk upstairs. So technology has gone bonkers. It's a whole team approach. There's things that can uh, go awry where the prosthesis is not fitting properly and that then affects the training. So it's got to be a real team approach when we do this. Our insurance companies, they only allow us a certain number of physical therapy visits. And they have developed training programs for amputees that can be used post 
physical therapy. And they actually now have been certified to train both physical therapists and case managers in the program. So they travel the country training physical therapists in their program to treat patients with it. Do you feel the difference? More importantly, it's not see, do you feel the difference? One more time, just like that. Back in 1989, we started the amputee walking school. That was something which I didn't plan on doing it for this long, but once I did the first program, I was kind of hooked to try to help as many people as we could. I want to I want to live a normal life. I want to I don't want to depend on anybody. I never depend on anybody in my whole life. You know, now yeah, at the beginning of all of this, I needed help to go to the bathroom. I needed help for everything. And with this, I can get up and down stairs now. I couldn't do that. I was referred to it by a, the gentleman or the doctor who actually uh, built me this unit, Glenn Hutnick. And uh, he said, he left my options open, and I said, why not? Let's give it a try. It can't hurt. It can only help me. What they do is they work with patients, A, as a mentoring program. So if you were to lose your leg, God forbid, uh, and I knew of you, I could, help, I could have them come in to visit you, to help you adjust, to help you see what can happen, to talk to someone who's been there before and learn from them and, and see that it's not all that bad, that there is a tomorrow. Well, this is my first time here. I've been to other physical training, and right away I see the difference as far as them using different areas of uh, your body that helps you move or helps the unit itself function better the way it should. And my sight has changed, and he, he actually built me another one. And he also brought in another company that makes the leg uh, the best word I would say, it's computerized now. It does the work for me where the first leg, I had to do a lot more work just moving or taking a step. With this, a certain movement sets the motions that I need to walk. All the people coming to the program, we've trained over 18,000 amputees. Most of the people that come to the walking school are diabetic vascular patients. There are grandmothers and grandfathers that just run out of time in physical therapy. So this is a program that kind of takes place after the rehab process is over. And that just motivated me because people came looking for help. So more people that came looking for help, the more we wanted to do, and then it just expanded. I had tons of letters from children that wrote me, that thanked me for, for, for giving them a new view and a new outlook on, on what the disabled people are all about. I lost one dream, but you know, there's, there's an expression uh, that people use, and that is, you know, the Lord may close the door, but he'll open a window for you. And that's the way that my life has gone. It's gone in a whole new direction that is just so much more rewarding than, you know, any, any type of profession you can think of. You've got to practice where you first the parallel bars, but you got to come more forward at the hips. He had, um, he's a diabetic and he had low blood sugar, wound up in the hospital, bad circulation and everything, and... Eventually it led to the leg turning black and had to be amputated below the knee. You know, we, we met Den Dennis came into the hospital room the day before my husband was scheduled for the amputation. And Dennis is also an amputee below the knee. And he's an Olympic champion. And to see him coming in and that there's life after an amputation made a world of difference. I, I lost my leg in 2007. <laughs> like I used to walk like a penguin limping everywhere. Now I have no more limp. I've been with them now about two years. I love it here. I think this is like the best place. I've got friends I've told about it. You know, I go to the amputee coalition meetings, tell them about it. I go to a support group over at Southside Hospital, tell them about it. I tell almost everybody about it. Our, our whole thing is we want to make sure that the folks use these legs and continue to progress. So I'm proud to be able to to be able to, to fulfill people's lives in a way which gets them back to their life skill goals. The knee is going to grow. Our population is aging. 
uh, population, the diabetic population in our country is, is rapidly growing. So the need for our manpower is going to grow. It's trying to change the focus of the walking schools from being just a, a one-day program to really being something that's an everyday program. And that's what we always try to say to somebody is that uh, these are life skill goals. You have to live this. You, no one has ever graduated the walking school. Nobody ever will. You have to work at this for the rest of your life. It's got to be a, a self-motivating thing you do. I would say you've got to motivate yourself. I mean, you can go do whatever you want. There's people that won't do this. There's people that just, just will use the crutches. If you're not motivated to do this, to, to get back to as normal life as you can, don't waste your time. But if you're motivated, that's the only reason I'm here, is I wanna, I wanna be able to go outside and uh, take a walk or wash my car or go in the garage and grab a screwdriver. If you don't wanna do those things, then don't do it. I've met a lot of great people. Like Rod today, you know, Chuck, you know, seeing meeting him today. And that's what's the best part about this is any place we go around the country, we have friends and they come back and they see us and they, we help them reach life skill goals. They come back and show us what they've accomplished. That motivates us to want to do more and hopefully we keep motivating them to want to do more. The possibilities are limitless. Mm -hmm.